Hello, Faithful Politics listeners and watchers. This is your faithful host, Josh Bertram, and our our um, political host is not able to be here today, um, but we do have a guest with us. I think this is, what is it, Trimper, the third or fourth time? I think this is the third time. Yeah, that's right. Third time. We've had you on. It's great to have you back. Uh, this is Trimper Longman, Dr. Trimper Longman the third, really. Um, and he is a Old Testament scholar um, and uh, very, very uh, prolific in his writings. And we've done different introductions in the past. And you can go back and check those out as as you need. And he's a, and, and, but one of the best. And we're so glad to have you back, Trimper. How are things going? Yeah, good, Josh. Thanks a lot for inviting me back. So had a nice Thanksgiving and um, and just working away at my next book. So <laughs> that's awesome. Well, tell us about the next book. I know you had just mentioned it, but I know that there are people here that listen and 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 would be super interested. What's going on with your next book? Uh so um, my last book was a commentary on Revelation, though I did also that came out about six months ago with Kriegel. It's in a series called the New Testament through Old Testament eyes. Wow. And then I was one of five views on Christ in the Old Testament. And one of those five views books that Zondervan points out, but while those were in press, I was working on uh, the first book of a trilogy. This one's on literary approaches to the study of the Old Testament, you know, as Robert Alter said years ago, um, he said, every culture and every time period tells its stories and writes its poems in different ways. So um, one of the keys to really being able to interpret well, uh, not that you won't understand it at all, but it helps you to enrich your understanding if you know how ancient Hebrews wrote, um, you know, story-like histories. That's what I call them. The, that's the interesting thing about Old Testament narrative. It's, I, in, uh, it is historical, but it's told in a story-like way with well-developed characters, gripping plots. And so it's helpful to know how um, ancient Hebrews told their stories and, and how they wrote their poems. Uh, so we can understand the message more deeply, more clearly. Again, it's not as if you can't understand the important message of scripture with that, with, with, without that knowledge, you can. But then the second volume is gonna be on historical approaches, the Old Testament, and the third volume's on uh, theology. So Old Testament theology. So that'll, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm sure, man, I can't believe it. How many books that you write? How, how often, like, how much do you write a day? Do you have like a goal? Like, I got to write like 2,000 <laughs> words, 3,000, what, what, what is it? Um, yeah, it kind of depends on where I am, how, whether I'm researching or I'm also involved in translation projects and stuff like that, editing. Uh, but I, I try to average between 500 and 1,000 words a day. Yeah, I am a word counter, and it's interesting. I found out that uh, that some of my also prolific colleagues, like Kevin Van Hooser, who was actually one of my first students, uh, he, That's amazing. He, he counts words too, and so does um, so did Anthony Trollope, the 19th century. But... Um, yeah, so the advantage of counting words is to kind of hold yourself accountable because when something I'm working on now might not actually see the light of day for two, three, four years. So you have to have a sense of delayed gratification. <laughs> to write 500 words gives you a sense of, so I have records of how many words I've written a day stretching back at least to 2011 when I started, started that practice. <laughs> man, I got, I got to pick up that practice because I'm in my doctoral program and I'm telling you, man, I just, I, I, it, it is, it's painful to write. I don't know <laughs> what it is, but it's painful at first. I'm assuming it's like a muscle, right? Yeah. It's sore right. and then it gets easier over time. Please right. tell me if it's easy over time. <laughs> 
Yeah, it does. It does uh, indeed. Uh, I remember writing my dissertation, and of course, I I wrote my dissertation on fictional Acadian autobiographies <laughs> in a just before the personal computer became available. So, oh my word! I think I paid three thousand dollars to have somebody type my dissertation out, and then I oh my goodness! The very next year, I bought my first personal computer for three thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we won't we won't ask what year that was. That's amazing. End of the seventies. End of the seventies, yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, it's so good to have you on the program. You know, I was thinking about when you're um, talking about the literary, um, you know, the way that the Old Testament, you know, is 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 text, right? We all know that, and right. it's supposed to be approached as text. And I was thinking, what would be like a modern equivalent? But I. I think about like investigative journalism and how they try to write factual things in a way that's interesting, which yeah. isn't always easy to do. Right. Would you say like, what would you say would be, and we're going to talk about like religious freedom and stuff, but this is a super um, interesting thing to me. What would you say would be like the closest like parallel to something like we have like in those Old Testament narratives today that would be, truthful meant to represent something to represent truth but at the same time obviously not in maybe in the technical way that we would want to see everything detailed and chronologically precise and all that what what, what do you think would be a uh, like an equivalent yeah that's a great question in um and and this is not equivalent in terms of the factual nature of scripture, which I will address in the second volume. But to illuminate the literary side, uh, what is most helpful actually is the analysis of modern novels um, and how modern novels are written. And, and, and again, I am very mindful and intentional when I say these are story-like histories. Um, but, um, but we typically don't write history in that way, though there are some historians who, who will write in a, as you say, a very, um, kind of, um, you know, artful way, you know, so yes. um, thinking of John Meacham maybe, and, and others who are just good writers and are, uh, writing for a broader audience. So, so, um, so actually one of the things I've been doing is reading a lot of modern, what's called narratology in terms yeah. of secular literary theorists and critics who, who analyze how to process a novel. And it's really helpful. How is speech represented and how, is, um, you know, how our character give you insight, how narrators work, you know? So in the Bible, most of the prose is third person omniscient narration, you know? So um, uh, some, the narrator knows what people are thinking, what people are doing in multiple places at the same time. <laughs> as opposed to other types of, well, except, and the exception is our, our parts of Ezra and Nehemiah, where Ezra and Nehemiah mm -hmm. are talking in the first person. <clears throat> different right. type of narration. And so it's kind of interesting to ask, well, what are the effects of this strategy of narration? Where, uh, and, and you know, the, the I, I think it's true that, the narrator's kind of representing the author's perspective on matters. And then of course, with scripture, for those of us who believe it's the word of God, then we start talking about what's God, uh, God's the ultimate author of the right. right. And the, and the, and the strategy of using third person omniscient narration where the narrator is both omniscient and omnipresent, I think, kind of intentionally gives the sense that you're getting the divine perspective on things. So, 
Yeah, that 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 makes a lot of sense. You know, it, it's 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 funny because the way like you 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 said something which I've heard a lot and I agree with that we can catch the overall story of scripture. Um, no matter whether we have like you know training in narratology or not. Right. Like, I would, I, I, I would certainly hope that our salvation, yeah. I didn't believe and I didn't depend on our expertise in narratology. Yeah. And yet at the same time, it shows the kind of complex nature of, of what we're actually dealing with. Yeah. And I think is, uh, yeah. people writing things down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which is a totally, you know, uh, um, which deserves a whole, a whole series of podcasts. Yeah. Um, and uh, but we we send, we we tend to oversimplify things to try to make them easier for us to just uh, grasp and easier to just make a uh, judgment about or something like that. And yet the world doesn't come to us like that. Right. In investigation. Right. Yeah, I think there are two errors that two different types of errors people make. On the one hand, they think everything is clear, and I don't need any special training to understand anything in scripture. And then on the other hand, there are those who think, well, we can't understand anything in scripture unless we're, (laughs) unless we're trained or even then maybe not, but go back to the Westminster Confession of Faith. And what we're talking about here, theologians refer to as the perspicuity of scripture, the clarity of scripture. Yes. And so the Westminster Confession of Faith has a really good statement on this when it says, it begins the statement on the clarity of scripture by saying not all things in scripture are clear <laughs> in and of themselves right but those things that are essential for salvation are clear when interpreted by ordinary means now here's another interesting little twist on that is if you're an english speaker who doesn't know hebrew and greek uh, you need specialists like me to translate it for you. Yes. And then what you may not realize is when we're translating, we're making tens of thousands of interpretive decisions. And so, but that shouldn't bother people because again, uh, if you just, even if you just compare all the translations, there are differences, but not on those things that are essential for salvation. (laughs) So that's such a crucial thing to know and understand. And, and yet that's like when in a normal way, when things are preached or talked about or the things that someone might see on a soundbite on, you know, this pastor or whatever, we, my wife and I just watched the, uh, um, she, she was watching and I, I came in with her, um, towards the end, but, um, the, uh, Hulu documentary called God Forbid. I don't know if you've heard of it or seen it. It's about um, uh, what happened with Jerry Falwell Jr. Oh, right. right. And um, everything that happened there. And, uh, and we actually had the director on the podcast and talked with him. And it's just, yeah, it's fascinating because most people, when they look at it, they just think, you know, that's their representative of Christians, of religious people or whatever it is. And you just look at this, you're like, that's not representative of me in any way. Right. And yet we look for the sound bites and people yeah. look for the sound bites and they oversimplify things. Yeah. And um, we do that in all sorts of areas, including, right. Including, and especially political, political yeah. things. Yeah. We absolutely um, oversimplify um, uh, political issues. And I think that's one of the beautiful things I love um, talking with you about because of, of your perspectives and because of the work you did and, the Bible and the Ballot, which is still um, right, a great book we recommend for anyone to get, especially Christians, to kind of think through um, the you know complexities of what's of of what we're dealing with here when we're dealing with Scripture. But there is no there is no verse, chapter, and verse per, per, per se that tells me, for for example, that tells me how to. Um, understand where to fall on, let's say, the case of 303 creative versus, I think it's, um, what is it called? 303 creative. 
and Elanis. Sorry, I just had to get, I was blanking on the second one. They're the recreative in Elanis, which is this new, right, um, this new court case coming before the court. They just had oral arguments on Monday. So it's Thursday, December 8th at the time of recording. So it was Monday, 7th, 6th, 5th, that they um, had these oral arguments. And I've been listening to them, but it's, I need a chapter and verse, Trimper, to help me make a decision on this on this, um, on whether or not this uh, lady should be able to have um, freedom of speech to deny same-sex couples um, her, her, you know, artwork um, yeah. as a creative designer. Can you tell me where the chapter and verse is to, <laughs> to make that decision? Yeah, I, I can't uh, tell you that because the, uh, Bible doesn't give us uh, specific public policies like that. The Bible does give us uh, principles by which we should think through questions like that and also uh, uh, should affect our, um, you know, emotional response to it and should temper our rhetoric. But um, but I'm not saying that scripture wouldn't give us principles that might help us think through it in various ways. Uh, but you have to do the hard work of that. So, of course, the Supreme Court is not going to decide this based on scripture. They're purportedly yeah. going to decide it based on the Constitution. Um, and... Uh, which itself is a matter of interpretation, right? It's, yes. It's, uh, Precedent. Just, and it's not even the Constitution. I hardly even hear them talk about the Constitution. I mean, yeah, I do, right. but it, everything's about yeah. this oh, case, yeah, right. that case right. in here right. and all that. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't been listening to the oral arguments. I have been following the general story. Um, and, you know, um, you know, interested how it, related to the earlier case concerning the Colorado Baker. I think this woman's in Colorado too. I guess these are all she is. that that C CATA or whatever it's called. Yeah, the um their anti discrimination act. That's what it all has to do with and then this um accommodations, public accommodations clause in it and what it actually applies to. And, so uh, we don't need to be experts on that. We'll have another person on the podcast. Can help yeah. But um, yeah, but, but, say, but I will say that I would start actually uh, with a statement about scripture that might shock some American Christians in particular in by saying that uh, the Bible has no presumption of religious liberty. Okay. What? <laughs> guns, my Bible, my country. Yeah, um, <laughs> there's no presumption of religious liberty. Uh, and Jesus I'm, said to get the sword, right? So that basically was saying guns are okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, I, I digress. But uh, but yeah, I mean that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting verse. It's a little bit cloudy. It does seem to be saying that the disciples should should take just enough weapons for self-defense, you know, <laughs> traveling around. That's the way that's often interpreted, and it might be the right way of interpreting it. But, um, you know, so if you think about it, in the Old Testament, there's no religious liberty in ancient Israel. No, you're not allowed to worship different gods. Yeah, it's not like, you know, you have freedom of conscience. Um then when you move to the New Testament, uh, Christians and, you know, Christians and Jesus have no religious liberty and they're not spending their time lobbying for it. All right. They are being faithful in the midst of the lack of religious liberty. They're they're obeying God in spite of the fact of not having religious liberty. And so I think that's the most important thing. Christians today should recognize as we enjoy pr probably more religious liberty than at any time in history and in culture. And that includes back, that includes back in at the time of our founding fathers. Okay. 
So if you if you're if you're thinking we're losing things that the founding fathers and that generation enjoyed, you don't know history. <laughs> you don't know how Catholics were treated or yeah. treated or you know and um and and so forth. So Any religion, right, that came in as a new religion right, America, right. was initially persecuted, would you say, or un or not accepted? Right. I'm, I made, you know, the Puritans of New England hounded Roger Williams out because he wasn't reformed enough. OK, so he goes down, <laughs> he goes down and founds Rhode Island. So <laughs> it's it's um, it's it's um, so. So in again, in any case, uh, now where there are significant questions about Christians' religious liberty, particularly in relationship to L LTQ, oh, I, I get it. yeah, I, I understand, yep, totally. Um, uh, and we're fretting that our world is being taken away from us. You got to keep that historical perspective in mind. Mm. Um, and, and also, so, and as I now go and say, yeah, though the scriptures do give us a theological basis for wanting to enjoy religious liberty, and that is we're all created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think from that, you can derive a, a sense of, um, you know, conscience and individual, but then where but this is something that is not just for Christians or religious people. Right, yes. This type of liberty, religious liberty, should be for everybody. Muslims, right, right. Jews, um, for agnostics and atheists. Now, they might not want to refer to it as religious liberty, but it is a kind of religious commitment to be an atheist or a agnostic. But in the United States of America, yeah, absolutely. which is a secular pluralistic country, um, we should be advocating for and hoping for uh, liberty for all of its citizens. And as Christians, we shouldn't be trying to coerce non-Christians, um, you know, into our values by force, <laughs> whether, uh, yeah. So uh, there, are, there are many values like um, that we share with all of our citizens uh, when, when it comes to things like theft and murder, but there are other issues where there is significant disagreement. And some of them are brought with all kinds of ethical issues that need to be talked through, but, but still, I think uh, in this country where Christians enjoy unprecedented religious liberty, um, we need to be very careful about how we talk about our liberty in relationship to other groups, uh, just by principle, but also, you know, if you ask the question, why does the gay community take such a hostile stance against Christians? That's a great question. Well, part of it, I think, has got to be historical. Oh, yeah. Going, back, going back to previous generations where, where, um, where, you know, Christians have harassed, marginalized, hated gay people. So, the gay community might be fearful of Christians. And so, but yeah, so it's a complex issue, Josh, as you know. Oh, absolutely. And it's a, um, and, and they would be, they would be afraid, right? Depending on what their experience is with a certain type of Christian. Right. Um, and maybe they're Christian themselves. I know many, yeah, um, right. Yeah, people in the gay community, and I know of right that are that are Christians, and and feel like God would, um, at a minimum, just loves them no matter what, or at uh, or even more might um, would say that 
would affirm uh, same-sex marriage and things like that. Um, how, how should a how should a Christian, a, a reasonable, good-thinking, um, um, conscientious, loving Christian, um, address something like like same-sex marriage or um, or, or which is where this is deriving from, right? Yeah. It's all, so it, it's this religious freedom around us, but all this really, I mean, it's coming from the decisions in Obergefell yeah. um, and the decisions in loving, you know, the, the things that happened that led up to where we are in terms of court precedent. How, how, how do you think, and even getting into the methodology of how someone might reason and, and process this, how do you feel like a Christian should approach this issue in our pluralistic society? Yeah, so, um, and and I would direct people to that book you mentioned, The Bible and the Ballot. Absolutely. Which has a chapter on same-sex marriage or another book, uh, Confronting Old Testament Controversies, which takes a look at uh, sexuality along with evolution, divine violence, and uh, right. history. To get the you know the detailed argument, but I would begin by affirming traditional sexual ethics that um, that you know when you which uh, prohibits same sex relationships, where you have um, the New Testament affirming what we read in the Old Testament, which is which is different than, say, issues like slavery or patriarchy or polygamy, where there's a where there's a move from the Old Testament into the New Testament, uh, or you know the most obvious case where you get a kind of what some people call redemptive ethical trajectory in Scripture mm. is with divorce, where Jesus in Matthew 19 says, yeah, you can only get divorced for matters of sexual um, infidelity. Uh, I would argue that Paul adds to that later, but, uh, yeah, yeah. but but notice what the disciples and the Jews around say. They say, that's not what Moses said. And then, yeah. and Jesus doesn't respond by saying, yeah, Moses was wrong. He doesn't say that. <laughs> doesn't say you misunderstand Moses. What he says is Moses said that because of the hardness of your heart. Mm. So what he's saying is now that I'm here, <laughs> it's it we're going to go closer to God's creation ideal of uh, which you can read about in Genesis two, where marriage is established, and um, and so so again not. To get too sidetracked on that, um, I don't even think it's a sidetrack. To be honest with you, Tremper, because I feel like this is a central issue. But go w whatever you need to say. But yeah, go on whatever trail you need to. Yeah. So so in in my reading, you don't get that same kind of trajectory from the old into the New Testament on same sex issues. So so I would begin there, but then. The next question is the question. Can I pause you for a second there, Tremper? And let me make sure I understand. So what you're saying is that there's certain issues like slavery, like polygamy, like, um, so that would be sexuality in marriage, like um, patriarchy, patriarchy, would... things like that, where you see this shift from the old into the new, where Paul would say something like there's neither male nor female, slave nor free, or something like that. Or Jesus would, but Jesus and Paul and the New Testament authors reaffirm an Old Testament, especially moving be previous to Moses in the law, all the way down, all the way to creation yeah. itself, and would say that that is a fixed, a kind of a fixed, um, like rule or, or 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 you know way of reality that God has put into the world. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Does it shift culturally? Is that is that 
kind of yeah. getting to the idea out. Yeah, so, and Genesis 2 is such an important text here if you want to understand God's creation ideal, his intention in creation. You read Genesis 2 and you can't imagine anything like slavery. And certainly right. no uh, room for polygamy. You know, it's... it's uh, he didn't create more than one woman for right. the man, right? And that is something that, that's an important point, right? Yeah, and so in Exodus 21, though the law allows for and regulates polygamy, it doesn't forbid it. So God is taking the people where they are and moving them toward the creation ideal in these areas. And even further, when you go into the New Testament, and because of the passage that you cited from Galatians 3, I think it's 28, and other passages like that, that gives impetus even after the New Testament time for Christians to move toward the abolishment of slavery hmm. for the establishment of monogamy, because polygamy was still being practiced in New Testament times. Right. Yes. And, and, and then, um, and also toward equality between men and women, like we see in Genesis two, but you don't see that same sort of trajectory. And, and I should, by the way, uh, cite the uh, an important book, uh, which is William Webb's book, uh, which is called "I May Get the Order Wrong: Slaves, Women, and Homosexuals." But but I talk about this in in those two books I referenced earlier as well. So so, but that's a different question, as I understand it then how should a Christian react to same-sex marriage in a secular, pluralistic society? Now, some Christians say, well, we should get rid of the secular, <laughs> pluralistic society and reestablish a Christian nation. I would say, mm. first of all, that's a myth. And secondly, that often verges on idolatry. And it, uh, it's... Drill into those a little bit, because I think those are so important. The myth and the and idolatry. Well, I think the the point, the, the the most important point I would make is that people who are who are Christian nationalists, uh, they they are acting on a fundamental hermeneutical error, which is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Right. So in the Old Testament, there is a godly nation chosen by God, uh, namely Israel. Yes. But in the New Testament, the people of God are not a nation. It is a church drawn from many different nations and ethnicities. Right. So um, the idea of a Christian nation is an, is an oxymoron in a New Testament time period. Hmm. And and I have to say, I, I love America and um, and I I love uh, I love our founding fathers. I live what eight miles from Mount Vernon. I'm yeah. a member of Mount Vernon. We go down there all the time. We just were at Monticello. Uh, and having gone to Monticello is a good reminder that our founding fathers were not all devout Orthodox Christians. No, they were not. <laughs> they were not and you know, three miles from here is the monumental temple-like George Washington Masonic Lodge. <laughs> so so uh, Pete Lelbeck, uh, the president of Westminster, wrote a book on, a thousand-page book on George Washington, whose central thesis is that Washington was an uh, Orthodox evangelical Christian. And wow. my, my response to that book is, if you're an evangelical Orthodox Christian, it doesn't take a thousand pages to prove that, right? <laughs> so now, I'm not saying Washington won the Christian. I'm, I'm just sure, right? That, that I think sometimes evangelicals picture our founding fathers as people who would be members of good standing in, in their churches. Um, yes, and they and they and they kind of pick and choose, yeah. cherry pick those things that are like really reinforce their narrative like you know the puritan 
you know, writings coming into America, but not all the writings of people coming into America in the 13 colonies reflected that kind of attitude. And uh, yeah, so, and where I was going to go with this is <laughs> I recently read a book, I forget the title of it, I got it over there somewhere or the author's name, but it was basically on how the founding fathers used the Bible uh, in their thinking. And my reaction after reading it is they were really bad Bible readers, especially of the Old Testament. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, but, but Christian nationalism, uh, you know, is the idea that this country was founded as a Christian nation, and it and, and there are different there are different shades of that by sure. the way, uh, but. The most pernicious type of Christian nationalism is the one that would argue, say, that the law of the United States ought to reflect the law of the Bible. Um, yes. And so I, probably the most extreme example of that that I, comes to immediately to mind is somebody like Doug Wilson up in Moscow, Idaho. Yes, yes. Uh, and... Um, who, who I haven't read it yet because it just came out, but he's been promoting a book written by a colleague on Christian nationalism. Yeah, the case for Christian nationalism. Yeah, so I, I, I pick it up and read it as well. Yeah, so I, I got I gotta I gotta read that. So so what I think Christians ought to be, um, you know, um, we should be concerned about the the purity and the obedience of the church. Uh, but I don't think Christians should be equally worried about public policy, say, but rather, rather than trying to coerce people into following our values, we try to make a persuasive argument that, that these values are, um, are, are, pathways to a flourishing life. And we ought to, right. and so um, I guess I'm also influenced by people like Martin Lloyd-Jones, the famous Welsh preacher of a Great past preacher. And, and I have him quoted in, in a couple of my books actually, where he says essentially, Christians should not make non-Christians or should not work to make non-Christians act like Christians. Yeah. Christians should work to make non-Christians Christians. And then looking at our present day, it seems to me that in our efforts to make non-Christians act like Christians, we're actually driving people away from Christ. And Absolutely. And, uh, and C.S. Lewis has another interesting way of putting it. He goes, I would not very much like a Mohammedan, which by which he <laughs> is a Muslim, you know, impose Sharia law and not let me drink my glass of red wine. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I don't know. I, I, I think, um, um, I, I, I think if people in the listening audience are, are attracted to Christian nationalism, I would just encourage them to really think through that issue biblically and theologically. I just, yes. I, I think the way some people reason is simply this, that, you know, God, God, um, uh, God's ethic is the best ethic and therefore we have to impose it on everybody. But it kind of also, um, yeah, so I'll just leave it there. <laughs> no, that's good. You know, there's a question. I mean, I, I love it. I mean, I, what I hear you saying is that, that this idea of Christian nationalism is based, number one, it's not good history. That yeah. we are founded as a Christian nation. It's right. not good history because it's hard. It may have come out of the milieu of Christianity, which was in, which you can't deny the effect of Christianity, Judeo-Christian worldview on, on America and on the Western world, right? And no one's trying to do that. But it was specifically made to be not to be not uh, beholden to one right. 
particular religion, right? So I hear you saying that, and I and I agree with that. And also on the other side, that the idea of religious freedom is not a biblical idea, though it could be a biblical inference from being made in the image of God. Yeah. Meaning we could come to that conclusion based on the fact that we're made in the image of God, so we have our own conscience, we're we reflect him in our thinking, and when we diverge, um, especially in the New Testament, where God, where Jesus did not call down legions of angels to destroy the Roman uh, Empire, he did not set up an army to go against Rome, um, but rather his kingdom, right in John, is of a different world, right. and so we're to take that very seriously and say, anytime we're conflating Christianity with a political power. We've stepped over a line. Yes. Yes. That is no longer biblically justified. Correct. Here, here's my question that I've, that I've thought about quite a bit. Do you think, now let's imagine, right? And I, I completely agree. Stipulating that, number one, it's a myth that, that America is a Christian nation, you know, specifically Christian nation or anything. Two, um, that the New Testament is not... There, there isn't a human political um, force in the New Testament that, that Jesus is calling anyone to. He's not calling them to political activism, He's, although they will have, we are people, so we have political um, implications to what we do, yeah. depending on the society that we live in. But we're to operate within those societies, right, being a yeah. voice for the gospel and for the kingdom that's above all. Do you think that a country... Let's say, let's compare, uh, let, let's just even for sake of argument, just two hypothetical countries, right? One, one country does things let, that you would look at and say, those are in alignment with biblical values, yeah. okay? Another country is not in alignment with those, like in any way. Um, would you say that that country would maybe receive more blessings from God in a general way? Or well, would it be, or, or how, I mean, does that question make sense? Oh yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Okay. What, what do you think? Well, yeah. So it actually relates to a question concerning individuals, right? And it's what you're raising is the whole issue of retribution theology. Uh, and you read the book of Proverbs and it, seems to suggest that if you're godly, wise, and uh, righteous, you're going to be rewarded. And if you are, and so you, you, could, ex, you could expand that to uh, nations. But, but, but the scriptures also recognize, take the book of Job, take uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, take Psalm 73, uh, that that it doesn't always work that way. <laughs> that God, God uh, take Jesus's life. You know who's who's more who's more righteous, godly, and wise than Jesus? And did he live, <laughs> did he live a life? Did he live a life of wealth and success? And <laughs> no, <laughs> the answer is yeah, no. <laughs> it's like so. The way I understand it uh, is though that. All things being equal, you know, following God will lead to uh, a desired conclusion, you know. But I like that, all things being equal, all things yeah. being equal, but things are not always equal. So, just like Job's yeah. three friends made a fundamental error by looking at Job's suffering and then reasoning from that that he was a sinner. So if you look at a country that is struggling and and then you then just automatically uh, connect that to um, their not following God, which may be true, <laughs> but I don't think we sh it's just like I remember when um, when uh, Katrina hit New Orleans. Yes, I think it was Jerry Falwell Sr. who said, this is because of the sin of New Orleans. Right. 
And what he didn't look at a map, you know, because the parts of New Orleans that got wiped out were the parts with all the big evangelical churches and where New Orleans Baptist Church is, whereas the French Quarter was high and dry. <laughs> so it's kind of like you, it's dangerous to, so, um, so, you know, I think the point is, and, and this is, I, you know, I mentioned, I just uh, published this commentary in Revelation. It's called New Testament through Old Testament eyes. And what struck me again and again about Revelation, which is the same that struck me as I worked on Daniel, I wrote a commentary on Daniel 20 years ago. So uh, both these books are writing to God's people when they're being marginalized, persecuted. You know, mm. they're really down. And 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 um, and what's the message? The message wasn't take over the culture. It wasn't. It wasn't. Um, it was. It wasn't. It was basically. Saying that it looks like evil's in control, but mm -hmm. let me assure you, God's really in control, and He'll have the final victory. Mm -hmm. Not, not, not necessarily a victory in your lifetime, <laughs> and right. certainly, certainly it wasn't for people like John. Right, right. Uh, yeah. But an ultimate victory. So, in a sense, we can say that 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 we're called to be faithful and obedient in the midst of marginalization, not because that will uh, lead to a prosperous life necessarily uh, in this lifetime, but certainly in the eschaton, you know, so. Right, in, in the next life. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, and by the way, I, I, I think it's appropriate for Christians to be political activists, <clears throat> um, but not angry, violent political activists. It's certainly totally legitimate to advocate for, you know, our values, um, you know, <laughs> to work toward the alleviation of the poor. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I I think actually, uh, you know, I don't I don't think the Bible says whether you should build a wall or whether you should welcome all immigrants in. But I know it tells us we should love all immigrants. Yes, <laughs> and that and that and that. Yeah, I think we ought to be careful about our security, but not at the expense of risking ourselves to help the downtrodden. Mm. So, mm. so when, when you when you get Christians demonizing immigrants as a group, yeah, that is definitely not biblical. Uh, it's yeah, not, it is. not following Christ, who by the way himself was a refugee, as has often been pointed out when he was taken down to Egypt. It was. <laughs> Yeah, I saw a funny meme that said Jesus Maria and or it was Jose Maria and Jesus is like crossing borders for two thousand years. It says yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know to um, la, la, Latino, yeah, Latino, Latina, and then uh, and their your young son. It was, I think it was a drawing, but it was just yeah. it was a fascinating idea. You know that yeah, he was. It followed Christmas quickly. <laughs> that they were, that they were, the Christmas baby was a political refugee fleeing. Yes. yes. And you know, it makes me think, and this will probably be kind of the last question here, but it makes me wonder like, um, it, it, trying to figure out how we as believers, and then obviously the people who listen who are, not believers, maybe giving them perspective into uh, maybe the in, internal struggle that um, their fellow citizens um, have that have this kind of faith. Um, like it, it's such a struggle to know how to operate in this world, right? Especially in our context mm. with um, 
like in, in a way that both honors our conscience yeah. and, our, and, our, and our deepest commitments and also, um, you know, let's, let's the other be themselves, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and um, th there's like a, there's this, it seems like there's this trend that anytime you try to persuade someone um, that like that's doing violence against them. Yeah. Yeah. Which I mean, seems intuitively wrong to me, but I can't quite hit why. Yeah. Now, I haven't done too much reflection on it. I'm, I know I could come up with a, a few reasons, but what do you think, like in terms of like arguing, yeah. in terms of like trying to persuade, right? Because it seems yeah. like that's what we are called to do, to yeah. be an alternative society and, and within the society, alternative community, I should say, maybe. Um, and, but to also persuade, mm -hmm. what do you think the role of persuasion is? Yeah. And to the Christian today in our, in our society. Yeah. Well, I definitely think Christians ought to be in the business of persuading Funda first of all, that's what evangelism is, right? <laughs> Essentially, right? And, and, and yeah, you're right. Uh, and then, um, and then, but also in terms of other uh, values and and how you do that in any situation is a matter of wisdom. You have to be able to not just know what's right. You have to be able to read the other person, the context, and uh, and and make the, that's what biblical wisdom is. Biblical wisdom is more than just knowing. Proverbs. It's knowing when to apply Proverbs depending on the situation. So, um, and there's a debate. Um, longtime friend going back to when we taught seminary together with uh, Tim Keller, who's had such a magnificent influence. But there's a whole school of thought out there that I've seen on in the in the social media world, which is a, which is attacking Tim's winsome persuasiveness. And say, yes. <laughs> and it's like, what? Really? You just want to be an angry, red faced person because you think that? I, I think that's folly, not wisdom, <laughs> what there yes. is. Right. So, a case. And, and it's not as if Tim hasn't offended lots of people just by being sure. persuasive. And he's been a faithful, faithful, faithful. Um, uh, witness to Christ through his whole life. So <laughs> it it makes me sad to see these kind of attacks on Tim. Oh yeah, man, it's 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 crazy. And it feels like we're just um fighting each other right now and trying to everyone's trying to hold on to something. And yeah, I think bringing making the case that you know we are you know, we should hold and love religious freedom. We should desire it, but we should desire it for everybody. Yeah. And not just us, because that's not religious freedom. Right. It's just for us. It's right. Just like, that's like a contradiction, right? right? Religious freedom for me, but not everyone else is essentially what that would be. And that, that the persuasion never lose the, the call that we have as a church, just persuade in both word and deed. Um, yeah. and how we and how we are seen um to the outside community any any last words you want to say on the on the subject uh i i think that's great good way to end our conversation josh with what you just said there that's awesome well thank you so much tremper i wish we could talk a little longer but um we uh, we have some time commitments that we have to get to but really appreciate it can't wait to have you on again once you've published your next book <laughs> we can talk about literary views the old testament and what, what all that means um but people can check you out again where where can they find your um where can they find your work well i mean the usual places amazon.com christianbooks.com any place where you can buy books. <laughs> and there you go, man. Is it a website? Do you have a website or anything you would point people to? I actually, I'm so old school. I, 
Well, maybe one thing we can do is we can work with you to get a website. <laughs> That's get right. Stuff out on there. <laughs> right. Well, thanks. Absolutely. Well, guys, this has been Trimper Longman. Trimper, thank you so much. Um, appreciate you. Always such a such a, a joy to talk with you. And uh, um, guys, we'll see you next time. Until then, um, stay focused and don't look left or right, but look up. Thanks, Trimper. Have a great day. God bless you guys. Thanks, Josh. Sorry. Oh.